This is as bad as I've ever saw it. This stuff's depressing here. This is this is uh, hard, hard to uh, hard to look at for me. That isn't enough to do the crop any good. Uh, we're beyond repair on the corn. The drought concerns this year have expanded exponentially. The crop I planted right now, I have more invested in this crop than I have invested in any other crop in my life. People don't realize we have no boss and we have nobody to help us. The hog operations are going to be really hurting because they need to feed corn. The poultry is really going to be in a squeeze because they need to, that's all a chicken will eat is corn. And the dairy guy has to feed corn to get his cows to produce lots of milk. There's a lot of competition for corn now, and there wasn't before. And the ethanol industry is allowed to continue to make alcohol. The crop is going to get ate up and it's not going to go into food. We're at the mercy of Mother Nature. Some people ask me why I don't gamble. Well, I gamble every day. That's just the way it is on your farm. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm VOA's food and agriculture correspondent, Steve Barragona. 2012 has been the warmest year on record and the driest since 1988. Drought stretches across about two thirds of the country as of October and it's hit some of the nation's most fertile farmland. And because the US is the world's largest exporter of corn and soybeans, the impacts have been global. The price of these commodities has hit new highs on global exchanges which has been raising the cost of feeding livestock in particular. In this program, we're going to look at the effects on some American farmers, and we'll also be looking at some new technologies and some old ideas that may help blunt the impact of future droughts. Since the beginning of the crisis, VOA's Kane Farabaugh has been documenting the impacts on some American farmers in the U.S. Midwest. That's the nation's corn belt, and we find him now in the state of Illinois. Kane? Thanks, Steve. By early June, no rain and intense heat were already taking a toll on Illinois farmers. Illinois is one of the top corn producing states in the country. McLean County, Illinois was one of thousands of counties eventually declared a disaster area by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. But signs of trouble here were already appearing early in the growing season. In this year's record setting heat, Under the hot summer sun, McLean County, Illinois farmer Matt Hughes crops are wilting. Well, we do have a good root system. It's just nothing going through it. Each day without rain clouds brings new disappointment and worry for Hughes. The crop I planted right now, I have more invested in this crop than I have invested in any other crop in my life. Hughes says that's because with commodity prices at all-time highs, so is the cost of seed and fertilizer. Now, he's watching his potential profits evaporate. Well, this is the one year that can make or break a lot of farmers. June was one of the driest months on record in many parts of the country, depriving corn stalks of much needed water during pollination. And um, this is some of the most productive ground in the world. It's not like I'm gonna make a choice to not produce it because I think we're gonna have a drought. Um, we produce it, we take what we can get. 
it's kind of waiting to grow again. As, there, as old as these plants are, they should be a little, quite a bit taller yet. They should be almost as tall as me. And you can see how, how stunted they are right now, this time of year. Matthew's farm in McLean County is in the heart of Illinois. And while it might have seemed bad there, it got worse the farther south you traveled. By early July, the weather had taken its toll on farmer Alan Bowers Jr. and his family, who watched their corn crop disintegrate. This is as bad as I've ever saw it. The corn stalks on his field near Du Bois, Illinois, are so dry and brittle, they break up just by touching them. And when you crunch it up, it just turns into dust. None of the stalks are producing usable corn. There should have been a a silk and an ear starting to shoot out, but right there is what is what your ear is. Because of the drought, thousands of hectares of his farm are in similar shape. It's very devastating. I mean, uh, uh, you get up in the morning and you think uh, it might be another 13 months before we get a paycheck. Uh, the corn and the soybean crop is our paycheck. In mid-July, Bowers made a heart-wrenching decision. Faced with a near total loss of his corn crop, he decided to cut it down. We are making what they call uh, corn silage out of this for the animals, for the cows. And if you wait till it's completely dried up, it won't even make suitable feed for the animals. So we have to do it in a timely fashion before the, the hot temperatures and winds dries it out anymore and turns it completely to just, you might say, dust. Dust is the consistency of much of Bowers' farmland, exposed to the wind now that the stalks are cut down. It's, it's all just powder like, like sand, you might say. Some of the only stalks left standing are for crop insurance adjusters to inspect. Alan Bowers and his wife Lori are hoping for a modest insurance settlement just so they can make ends meet until next year. People don't realize we have no boss and we have nobody to help us. And it's tough. You have to work together. You have to work with a husband and a wife and family and together try to work through it. The remaining land on the Bowers farm is filled with soybeans. The outlook for production is just as grim. And this year, I don't think there's going to be anything much to harvest at all. Lori's husband, Alan, says if next year is anything like the present, he isn't sure the farm that has been in his family for four generations can survive. It will be probably five times as challenging as what it is this year. The challenges of harvesting drought damaged corn was already evident to farmer Bruce Nation by late August. He was already in his fields in Taylorville, Illinois, harvesting mostly heartache. Yeah, this stuff, this stuff's depressing here. This is, this is uh, hard to, uh, hard to look at for me. Most of the ears of corn that managed to grow in his fields are much smaller than normal because of the drought. Smaller corn means less to sell, which cuts into nation's bottom line. Probably, I don't know, maybe 30 kernels on that whole thing. Uh, that's what we're up again. You can watch your uh, moisture run. Nation was also up against the risk that comes with planting and growing when the cost for seed and fertilizer are at all time highs. We're at the mercy of mother nature. It's just uh, some people ask me why I don't gamble. Well, I gamble every day. That's just the way it is on your farm. As he takes to the fields to harvest, this year, about a month ahead of schedule because of the drought, Nation is watching that gamble in real time. Thanks to an internet connection in his tractor, he keeps a close watch on the rapidly changing price for his corn and soybeans. I watch him every day. I have a consultant that helps me on my marketing. He watches it every hour. Commodity traders on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade are also keeping close watch over the rapidly changing prices, including GrainAnalyst.com's Matthew Pierce. Uh, the drought concerns this year have expanded exponentially as we've approached harvest, and some of the pro-farmer numbers that we've seen recently have shown much more damage than was even expected. Pierce says the outlook for both corn and soybeans gets worse by the day and has global implications. The U.S. exportable surplus is dwindling by the day. 
and China, Japan, South Korea, and Mexico are going to be most directly affected by that. We're at all-time level highs on corn and soybeans. It's, it, it, that really hurts everything over the long, long haul. You know, everybody's going to feel this effect. Including nation's neighbors. But despite all he faces, Bruce Nation will not call this year's drought a disaster. I wouldn't say a disaster, I would say a setback. It's going to set everybody back a little bit. Uh, but, you know, the, the farmer has is, is got, a, got a heck of a human spirit to him. And he's going to keep right on plugging. Next up are his soybeans. With a little more help from Mother Nature in the form of rain, that gamble might pay off for Bruce Nation. Farmers will harvest about 13% less this year than they did last year, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. That's the smallest crop size in six years. All of this comes at a time when demand for U.S. grains are at an all-time high worldwide. Most U.S. corn goes to feed livestock, so the smaller crop size means the cost to feed those animals is up. Meat prices are expected to increase about 4% over the next year or so here in the United States. Those higher prices will have the biggest impact on livestock producers, like Eastern Iowa farmer Rob Ewalt. Come on! Come on! Come on! on his farm outside Davenport, a creek bed usually flowing with water is almost completely dried up. His grazing pastures are so bare, he has to bring in hay and water daily to keep his cows fed. To make matters worse, some of his corn crop has wilted, and Ewald is worried that low supply and high prices will impact other parts of his farming operation. The hog uh, operations are going to be really hurting because they need to feed corn. The poultry is really going to be in a squeeze because they need to, that's all a chicken will eat is corn. And, and the dairy guy has to feed corn to get his cows to produce lots of milk. While campaigning in Iowa, President Barack Obama announced the U.S. government would buy up to $170 million worth of pork, chicken, and lamb to help those producers affected by the drought. Ewald views the announcement as a political maneuver. In the short run, it's going to help us, but to, to sustain us through what we're going to see over the next eight to ten months in these crop prices and, and our input costs for, for livestock, it's not going to do much at all. To add insult to injury, not only do those crop farmers have to worry about harvesting that crop and keeping their animals fed, they also have to worry about how that crop is transported. The lack of rain this summer throughout the Midwest United States dried up lakes and rivers, including the Mississippi River, one of the longest and most economically important waterways in the United States. The Mississippi River is a major route for transporting corn and soybeans to larger ports who send those commodities around the world. Keeping this river navigable during the historic drought fell on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's another day of intense heat in the Midwest United States. And another day without rain on the Mississippi River. On board the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers survey ship, the MV Pathfinder, Captain Terry Beckett is watching the river level drop. You see probably 15, 20 foot more bank than we had at this time last year. Uh, the sandbars behind you were not exposed last year at this time. Last year, heavy rains flooded the banks along parts of the Mississippi. This year, the level is so low, shipwrecks normally hidden underwater are plainly in view. It's low and it's bad, but it's not end of the world bad. Industry just lightens their loads and hopes for the best. That industry ships corn, soybeans, and wheat from farms in the Midwest to destinations around the globe. 60% of all grain exported from the United States travels on barges along this waterway. Any disruption has a ripple effect. So there's a lot of uh, money at stake for these farmers and there's other commodities that are coming down the river as well. It's uh, not just uh, grains but it's also uh, uh, some chemicals are coming down the river, uh, coal is coming down the river, various different things like that. Jason Brown is a hydraulic engineer with the Army Corps. He says ships need a channel nearly three meters deep and 91 meters wide to safely navigate. 
we are at a low enough stage with uh, the anticipated forecast going lower that uh, we're starting to initiate some communication between the navigation industry, Coast Guard, and the Corps to uh, make sure that we are accounting for all the things that need to be accounted for as water levels drop. Part of that accounting begins with Captain Beckett and his crew. They locate the shallow spots that could endanger traffic. We run a dredge survey and then when they decide whether it, it needs dredging or if we can buoy it. it you know, if we can buoy it, certainly that's the quickest solution. You know, obviously, the further it drops, the more jobs are, the more dredging sites are going to pop up. Companies that load their barges will have to lighten their loads as water levels drop, says Russell Arrett with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Since the river stages are lower, they have to kind of restrict their barge configuration, so that kind of cuts into some of their dollars and raises their O&M cost. But Arrett says the Mississippi River is still the most efficient way to ship commodities, as long as it stays open to traffic. As farmers watched the skies and the river levels this year, they also watched a relatively new player in the corn market. The production of ethanol fuel for cars now consumes at least a quarter of the U.S. corn crop. That's been a boon for rural towns like Galva, Iowa. But this year's drought has rekindled the fight between fuel and food. There has been a corn boom in rural Iowa, in America's heartland. In corn farming towns like Galva that had been shrinking for decades, new homes are being built. A new 400-seat performing arts center opened at the local school, and farmers like Alan Bennett are okay. buying new equipment. Um, this is my new combine. One big factor boosting the local economy is just down the hill from Bennett's corn and soybean fields. Quad County Corn Processors turns his harvest into ethanol fuel. There's um, three ethanol plants within easy driving distance of here, and there's a lot of competition for corn now, and there wasn't before. In 2005, Congress passed a law requiring ethanol in U.S. gasoline. One reason was to produce more fuel at home, says Quad County Manager Delane Johnson. As we have domestically produced products, we have less uh, dependency on the Middle East, where we obviously have spent money trying to defend that area. Use of domestically produced ethanol has grown as government requirements have increased. Now, at least a quarter of the U.S. corn crop is turned into fuel. Economists say that is one reason the price of corn is triple what it was before 2005. Bill Tenninger grows corn 100 kilometers away in Lamar's, Iowa. But he also feeds corn to his pigs. He supports ethanol to a point. It's been overdone, which creates a huge animal consuming that, that we have to compete with. Pigs, cattle, and chickens are competing with that other corn-consuming animal, ethanol, like never before, as this year's drought dramatically cuts the corn supply. Corn prices have set a new record. The livestock industry is facing big cost increases, and some meat producers may go out of business. So the industry is asking Congress to waive the law that requires ethanol in gasoline. If we do not waive that standard, and the ethanol industry is to allow is allowed to continue to make alcohol, the crop is going to get ate up, and it's not going to go into food. Tenniger says the cost of food will go up, hurting consumers already struggling in a slow economy. But farmer Alan Bennett says waiving the law would be a blow to his town and to consumers as well. It could bankrupt the ethanol plant. It's, it's a huge deal. Um, this country relies on ethanol for... 10% uh, of its fuel supply. Ethanol is good for America. Bill Tenninger agrees, but he says this year's drought has made him think differently. I have not been one of these that have really argued the food versus fuel argument, uh, but yet in the end, maybe it does come down to that. This year's extreme drought and the tough choices it forces may be a look into the future on a warming planet. Scientists expect more extreme weather with climate change, Coping with those changes is one of agriculture's biggest challenges for the 21st century. Some are looking for answers in biotechnology. The seed company Monsanto expects to be the first on the market with genetically engineered varieties better able to cope with dry weather. But some are saying, don't expect too much. 
Bruce Trotman's cornfields near Sutton, Nebraska, have received about a third less rainfall than normal this year. This morning's sprinkles will not help much. That isn't enough to, to uh, do the crop any good. Uh, or beyond repair on the corn. But Troutman is one of about 250 U.S. farmers field yeah, testing a new kind of corn, genetically engineered to tolerate the stress of drought better than conventional varieties. This ear here has the drought tolerance in it, drought gene. This ear does not. So you see the difference in size, the difference in kernels. The difference, according to Mark Edge with the seed company Monsanto, is a gene the company added to the corn plant. The gene is actually found in soil bacteria. It's a common soil bacteria. And what it does for the bacteria is it helps it uh, survive through that stress. Here's how it works. In normal conditions, a thin chemical ribbon carries instructions to the cellular machinery that makes corn plants grow. Under stress, that ribbon gets tangled and the machine jams. Adding the bacterial gene helps keep the chemical ribbon untangled and the machinery running smoothly. Bruce Troutman's corn looks good, but Monsanto's Mark Edge is cautious. Growers are very excited about it, but we need to wait until the yields come in from this fall to really get a better evaluation of that. Critics like Doug Gurian Sherman with the Union of Concerned Scientists say do not expect too much. It's a step forward, but it's very, very modest. Gurian Sherman says in severe droughts, the added gene may not help much. Some of Troutman's neighbors got less rain than he did. It's not clear that the drought gene could have saved them. And Gurian Sherman notes conventional crop breeding and better soil management are also improving drought tolerance without the cost and controversy of genetic engineering. There are more cost effective and more reliable at this point ways of um, improving things like drought tolerance. And, and we need, I think, to put more of our effort into, into those areas. And while he does not have any immediate safety concerns, he says testing should be more rigorous. Monsanto's Mark Edge says the seeds have been tested and regulators have approved them. And he agrees conventional breeding and soil management are important. There isn't one thing that's going to address drought. It's a combination of things, and this is a very powerful tool. On land getting drier with climate change, that combination of tools will likely include a crop that originated in Africa. Sorghum is a minor part of the U.S. harvest today, but as corn crops have withered in the worst drought in decades, more farmers are looking to this crop for the future. Walking through lush, green fields of sorghum, Nebraska farmer Fred Prokop treads on ground deeply scarred by weeks of drought. But he says the sorghum crop is patient. It'll wait for water, but like corn, you know what, that's done, even if it does rain. His corn crop is suffering, as it is in much of the U.S. Midwest this year, says University of Nebraska researcher Ismael Dwykot. And you could see how dry and how dead the corn is. You don't even have an ear on it. The shrunken corn harvest will raise the price of meat, milk, and eggs as the cost of feeding livestock goes up. Years like this one are why Dwykot is a passionate advocate for an underappreciated crop. Sorghum is used to harsh environment because it's raised there. Sorghum comes from hot, dry regions of Africa, where it is a staple grain and the stalks provide animal feed. Its waxy leaves and deep roots are better suited for arid climates than corn is. And Dwykot says that's going to be increasingly important. I think maybe this is the first year we have real drought in Nebraska, but I think more of it's to come. And he says making ethanol fuel from sorghum is more efficient than corn. A significant factor when at least a quarter of the U.S. corn crop goes to ethanol. With all that going for it, Dwykot has faith in sorghum. I know that it's maybe next year, the year after, the year after, 10 years from now. Even after I die, sorghum someday will be the crop. While Ismail Dwykot puts his faith in sorghum when the corn crop withers, most American farmers put their faith in crop insurance. Crop insurance payments in this very bad year may top $20 billion, which would nearly double the previous record. But one Iowa farmer has gone without crop insurance through decades of ups and downs, and he's done it by breaking with conventional wisdom. It's okay. 80-year-old Dick Thompson may not look like a radical farmer. I'm old-fashioned, and I'm proud of it. 
But Thompson's old-fashioned ways are radically different from other Iowa farmers, and they work. It's filled out to the end. He says he is earning more money per hectare than his modern farming neighbors. The yields tell me it's working, and don't mess with it. (laughs) Matt Liebman wants to know why it's working. His research fields at Iowa State University mimic much of what Thompson does. The reason we're doing this is because of what he's doing. One thing Thompson is doing is raising cattle when most Iowa farmers got out of the livestock business years ago. If I'd sell the cows, I would be like everybody else around me, corn and beans. Corn and soybeans carpet the Iowa landscape. Many farmers here grow nothing else. And when those crops do poorly, as they will in this year's drought, Payments from crop insurance keep farmers in business. Well, I have never bought crop insurance since we started to farm. Instead of crop insurance, Thompson protects himself the old-fashioned way. He raises corn and soybeans, but he also raises hay and oats, along with the cattle and hogs. I think it's common sense. You've got diversity and you've got some protection there. If one crop um, doesn't do well, maybe the other one will make up for the difference. And his hogs and cattle provide more than just income. They also provide manure to fertilize the soil, so Thompson does not have to use chemical fertilizers. And the manure helps the soil hold water, another form of insurance in a drought, says Iowa State University researcher Rick Cruz. It really adds to the condition of that soil that does favor crop growth, particularly under stress conditions, and that's the kind of conditions we're experiencing this year. Conditions farmers everywhere will face more often with climate change. Matt Lieben says his research shows Thompson has lessons for all of them. Well, there's pods here. Looking towards diversity, crop livestock integration, the uh, careful stewardship of the soil, making the best use of every drop of rain that falls. I mean, those things are all lessons that we should know here, and they're even more important elsewhere. And Thompson says with his way of farming, everyone wins. I think it's a better way of taking care of the land and the environment and and the pocketbook. You can have all three. Consumers' pocketbooks will feel the impacts of this year's historic drought, especially as the price of meat goes up in the coming months. It will take a large harvest in the southern hemisphere to replenish the depleted grain supplies. But in a world where the demand for food crops is soaring with increasing population and increasing prosperity, many experts do not expect the prices to return to where they were just a few years ago. That's good news for farmers when they have a crop to sell. But those high prices raise the cost of everything else it takes to grow that crop. Rent on farmland is up. So is the cost of fertilizer to make the most of that land. So farmers preparing next year's crops already expect a more costly harvest. One thing they can't expect is the weather. But one thing they're hoping for much more of next year is rain. For Steve Barragona in Washington, I'm Kane Fairbaugh in Illinois. Thanks for joining us.